party started. So welcome. My name is Donna. I'm one of the educators here at Bywater Solutions and I have with me the amazing Kelly, um, who is another one of the educators and we're going to be talking all about 1905 upgrades administration and report section today. So lots of exciting things. Um, you do have the link to the agenda that I have pushed into channel. I also want to make sure that you're aware of this link, which is for all of the upgrade notes and the Q&A from the webinars and all of that sort of stuff. Um, it's a great resource. So here we're going to have all of our links to the release notes, to the manual, to the schema, and then in addition, any of the blog posts and videos that we've created related to 1905 updates, uh, enhancements, things like that. All of the links to the recorded upgrade webinars will be there also. And then as y'all ask questions in the, in the chat or the Q&A, we'll go ahead and post, post all of those here too so that you can see all of those. Which does lead us to how do you ask a question? You do have the Q&A box that you can go ahead and um, ask your questions there. If you do use the Q&A box, everyone will see those automatically. If you prefer to use the chat window, that's fine too. Just make sure that you go ahead and, and use your to all panelists and attendees and that will go to everybody um, that they can see us. And if not, that's okay because we typically repeat those questions anyways and Kelly is going to be monitoring all of those. So question of the hour, when y'all getting upgraded? Everyone's probably heard this by now. It'll happen the week of December 8th, unless you have communicated with us specifically to have that changed. Um, we are gonna be doing all of the upgrades within one week. Um, we will populate your staff client with the upgraded notification at least a week prior. And just remember to clear your cache the morning after your upgrade and everything is gonna be absolutely amazing. Okay, so to start with, Probably no surprises because we have talked about this in every single webinar that we have done, and that is the MANA knowledge base. Um, so MANA is a new feature that is, uh, allows Koha to talk to this knowledge base that right now is being used for serial subscription patterns and reports. And reports are the most important, are the most exciting part of this one. It is a system preference setup and it does need to be activated. You need to go ahead and register with a email and a name system wide. So we don't recommend using, you know, Kelly loves cats at hotmail.com or anything like that. I would suggest going ahead and having a general um, email address that you can use to go ahead and set that up for those things. So that is something that does need to be set up for you. Um, we do have it. And you know, I don't know that I've ever come to it from administration. It's, it's there. It keep on going down. There it is because I was looking for the wrong thing. So under additional parameters, there is share content with MANA KB. And when you click on that one, you will have the boxes to go ahead and either say yes, no, or let me think about it. If you say no, let me think about it, you'll just get the little reminder blue box whenever you go into administration saying you haven't made your decision yet. Okay, ours is set to yes. You also do have the ability to automatically subs uh, to update your subscription serial patterns, things like that. We do not have ours turned on because this is a training site and I do weird things with our serial subscription patterns. So we don't want those automatically going. Um, but if you are confident in your serial subscription patterns and wanna have those automatically shared, you can go ahead and do that. Reports, which is what we're gonna be focusing on, do have to be shared but one by one. So you don't have to worry about those two. They're not gonna automatically be, be yanked from your site and shared. This is where you would go ahead and enter an email address and a name and you would be sent an email with a token. You would just click on that email. It'll go ahead and populate your token in here for you automatically. So it's pretty straightforward to go ahead and set that up. Okay. So then the real magic happens. Once you have this all set up and you go into your report section, there's not a link right now from here to be able to bring a, a mana, MANA report in there. But if I click on create from SQL and do a new report, you can see that I do have new SQL for MANA. So this is really exciting. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And then it says, tell me what keyword you're looking for. So I'm just going to look for a report that says added. I go ahead and I get my results. And so Koha has gone and looked at this knowledge base and said, here's everything that looks 
like something you might be interested in. So I get the report name, I get the notes, um, and if I hover over these, it will go ahead and give me a mouse over that shows me what that SQL is. So that's really exciting that you can just really quickly kind of get a sense of if that's going to be something that you're looking for or not. This search does, when I do that search, it searches the title, the notes, and the SQL. So it'll find it if it's in any of those different sections. So I'm going to go ahead and pull a report in. Um, we're going to do count by call number for items added in the last month. All I need to do is go ahead and click on this import button. And it has automatically added this report to my library. So it has already saved it and all of those sorts of things. Now, Something that we do make sure that you're aware of is that there does seem to be some formatting problems in here. So immediately off the bat, I can see that my where statement has merged into um, a selection field. And so I do need to go ahead and edit that one. Edit that one. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on edit. Um, so yes, Michael, you have hit on something that I constantly go on about, which is when you are creating your reports, please, name your reports appropriately and put meaningful descriptions for them. Um, you know, don't just say circulation report because that's not gonna help anybody. So definitely go ahead and use meaningful um, titles and meaningful descriptions in there, or even one or the other. If you don't wanna do both, make one or the other relevant, okay? Um, so from here, I can go ahead and see that I have this edit. I can change the report name at this point. I can add any notes to it, but I'm just gonna come in here and go through my report real quick. I can see I have a select. I can see I need to change the where. I need to, let me see what else we have in here. Oh, I see my order by, and I see my from also. So now I can go ahead and see using the code mirror functionality that was added, the select, the from, the where, and the order by. So my section is really set. Um, when you do the search, it does look for the notes box as well as the name. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and update that SQL. And now I can go ahead and run that report and I will be all set. So again, still a little bit of maintenance, but that's really just kind of the first time that you bring something in. You do need to do some of those really basic things. Um, you will also want to obviously double check to make sure it's not using any specific branch codes because those are obviously going to change from location to location. So there, there's a little bit of, of maintenance in there, but on the whole, it makes it so much easier to be able to go ahead and bring those reports in. Now the reports library, which is one of the things I obviously go on and on about, has been added to the MANA knowledge base. So those are all in there and you can go ahead and bring all of those in too. So really it's giving us one spot to be able to go ahead and add all of that information and we're all set to go. So really exciting with that one. Um, and this is just the result of the, the reports that I did that shows me my, um, my results. So really exciting. So then the next step is, well, what if I have- mm -hmm. Donna. Donna, sorry. I believe that there, there's a question about searching for the word and will it look in the notes portion. From my testing, I seem to find that it looked in notes and in the title and I believe the SQL. And in the SQL. The it looks in all three places. Yeah. Yep. And um, I was gonna say, Jane has asked, will the reports library still be maintained? And yes, we do expect that to still be maintained. Um, for now, there has not been any conversation about not maintaining it. Yeah. Because we know that not everyone's gonna use Mana. So, um, so now the, it comes up and I say, you know what, I am legendary for my amazing SQL reports. Right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. But if I was, I've created this excellent report here and I, I want to go ahead and share this. All I need to do is under my saved reports, I find the report that I wanted to, to share and I now have the functionality of share and this will go ahead and share that report to Mana. It goes ahead and shows what's going to be passed through so I can make sure that, that information is all correct um, and I can go and make any changes of it before I update that. I'm gonna go ahead and cancel this one because this is not a report that I actually would share, but we do have that there that we can go ahead and share those things. Okay. 
So very exciting. If you do not have Mana turned on, you will not see that share button. Um, so that is something to be aware of too. But Mana is a, a really exciting opportunity to be able to go ahead and share subscriptions and reports. Um, and hopefully we're gonna see it being used for a lot of other things too. So fingers crossed. Okay. A couple of other things I wanna go over in reports real quickly. So from our basic page here, our items lost report has had the there it goes um, has had the collection code added to that section so we don't actually have collection codes on most of the items in our database but here you can see that we do have the new column for collection. So that will also show in your lost report. So again, just another quick enhancement that's gonna really help those sorts of things. Okay, back to my using my saved reports. This is one of, has long been one of my pet peeves. So I have this report. I'm not maybe exactly sure what this is going to do. When I click on my little arrow here, I have this show functionality. It always used to drive me nuts because it would basically just give you a very compressed text file of what that actually does. Now, when I click on show, it actually breaks that down and displays it in the code mirror. So much easier to read, much more spread out, very, very happy with that. And then again, I can go ahead and click on edit from here um, if I have those permissions to be able to go ahead and edit that report. But it, it just makes it so much easier for you to be able to see what that report actually will do. So again, those little things um, that we like. Um, this last one we have talked about, I wanna say ad nauseum, which is, in case you haven't heard it, there's a change in the account lines that are coming. So currently in accounts, um, we are using um, F, F, U, and F4. So fine, updating fine, and forgiven fine. That is all being updated. Those reports that you have now, if they are using those statuses, your reports will come back looking like this. So it's not gonna show that it's broken necessarily. It's just not gonna give you any results. So we are working with all of our libraries. We've been going through our partner sites um, and we've been searching to see which libraries are using reports that have those statuses in there. Um, and so we can have been reaching out to libraries. Um, if you have reports that you know of that are using the F, the FU and the F4, um, either reach out to us if we haven't done that already um, and we will work with you to make sure we get those updated. Um, it's, let me show you the, the updated report. So number 37 here. This will show you. Okay. So actually you would see things like returned versus unreturned for fines. Um, so it's, it's changing from the F and the FU. So the FU is actually these unreturned fines and the Fs are the returned fines. So there's some changes in those sorts of things. Just want y'all to be aware of those. Again, we have talked about this a lot. Um, so I'm sure that y'all have, have heard about it, but if you have any concerns, as always, please reach out to us, let us know, and we'll be happy to work with you. This is one of those things that we can, we can fix those reports ahead of time by making duplicates, but you can't actually start using them until you get your 1905 upgrade. So just be aware of that. Okay. Permissions, this is always one of my favorite things, is permissions. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you the exciting changes that have been added to permissions. So when I'm viewing my patron record and I click on set permissions, look at this, isn't that wonderful? Instead of all of those things that were just kind of smushed together and didn't make any sense, this has all been set out um, so that you can go ahead and see all of those permissions, makes it a little bit easier to see those. Anything that's not being used, we have our show details for that one. But what's even better is we have a filter here. So if I cannot for the life of me remember where one of those permissions is supposed to be, I can go ahead and just put that, actually let me use plugin. Um, I can go ahead and just search for that word and it's gonna go ahead and show me 
any of those permissions that would be relevant to what I'm searching for. So really, really exciting, very quick, very easy to be able to see what those permissions are and what they may or may not need. We're also going to post in the Q&A some jQuery that Christopher Brandon has created um, that what once you've added that in there, what it's going to do is, is um, it sets up some quick set or clear buttons and it lets you copy permissions to another borrower. So we're gonna go ahead and post that into the Q&A section. Um, and actually, if you are, if you cannot possibly wait that long, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and post the link for that into our, our chat. Um, and that takes you to the jQuery library, which again, if that's not something that you've looked at, you really should spend some time there. There are some absolutely amazing jQuery that has been done um, through all of our community members. Okay. Next up is uh, something that's been sponsored by Virginia Tech. And this is the ability to limit password changes and forgotten password functionality by patron category. So this is something that's really fantastic if you are at a library where you have multiple classes of patrons. So if I have um, students that are being brought in through an automated import process, and then also have community members that are not being brought in through that process, I don't necessarily want my students to be able to change their password because that would basically just wreak havoc on everything, but I can go ahead and let my my community members who are not being done through automatic import or authentication to change their passwords. That's what this ability lets you do now is that I can go ahead and come into a patron category through administration. I'm going to click on the edit for the adult patron. And as I scroll down here, I can see that I've got new options. And so I've got my password reset in OPAC will either follow the system preferences that I have in there allow it or not allow it. So we can go ahead and put all of that in there, have it set up so that I can go ahead and let them either reset their password in the OPAC or do the password change in the OPAC. Not really worded very clearly. Um, the password reset is the one that I have forgotten my password. That comes to me through an email. Okay, the password change means I know my password, I've logged in already, but I want to go ahead and change that one. So that's the difference between those two functionalities. But again, very exciting. And I do love that it shows me if I was using um, the system preferences, what that system preference is set to right now. Okay. Okay, this next one is one that I'm really excited about. So there's quite a few in this section that I'm really excited about. There's some fun, fun additions. Again, none of these are gigantic, um, but I really do like the ability to do some of these things. So this is called OPAC More Searches. Actually, what I need to do is bring up our OPAC. So right now, I have this little phrase of HTML in my OPAC more searches. What that is doing is adding that right here. So before we used to have to know how to do jQuery to be able to add those things to this top bar in our OPAC. Now, all I have to be able to do is come into my system preference OPAC more searches and use a little basic HTML to go ahead and put that in there. Um, so again, really exciting, very quick responsive. If I go ahead and take that out and refresh my screen, that's now gone. So it's that quick to be able to go ahead and add those links up there. So I'm thinking you'd be able to use this on things that are just a temporary, something that you want to have up there, like, oh, I don't know, summer reading page. You could go ahead and link to the summer reading page just for those couple of months that you're dealing with that throughout the summer. So again, a nice little addition called OPAC more searches. You put in that basic little text, save that in there, and it goes ahead and adds that link into your bar here for, did it refresh? Oh. Let's try that again. No, 
okay, I broke something, <laughs> which is normal for me. <laughs> but again, it's so basically you can see that with that basic HTML, it is just an unordered list um, that you go ahead and put in there. Ah, there we go. I'm refreshing and clicking too fast. There we go, right there. And so then that does go ahead, and depending on your system preferences, if you have it open in the same window or a new tab, it goes ahead and takes you out to whatever those sites are. So really kind of a lot of fun. Um, a lot of flexibility to be able to do that um, and just add those in there. So it's another one of those really cool little things. Okay. GDPR. Kelly, what does GDPR stand for? Well, you know, Donna, I was just looking this up. Um, it, it means general data protection something regulation. But this first system preference that came in 1811 is, is not even in the manual. This oh my goodness. Yeah, because I was just linking it to the questions and answers and I'm so if you ever find yourself in this situation where something is not in the manual and it should be like a system preference, that you can create as a bug and file it under documentation. So then the documentation team can um, get that in the manual. But yes, it is the general data protection regulation because it says right on your screen. <laughs> So GDPR was um, released in 1811, so it is a newer system preference, and it was done in response to the European Union's um, GDPR. So it's a regulation that they've enhanced, which basically what it is, is it's letting, it's making sure that users are aware of how their data is stored, kept, cleared out, all of those sorts of things. So while we are not necessarily following what the EU does, I personally, as a librarian, love that we have this ability to go ahead and let our patrons know what we're doing with their data. So you will see that in the GDPR, in the system preferences, there are two of them right now, um, that these were the original ones that were put in there, which is whether or not you want to set it to disabled, enforced, or permissive. Um, if you enforce GDPR, patrons do have to agree before they can do anything in the OPAC once they've logged in. Permissive basically just lets patrons know what that information is. They don't have to agree to it or decline it. Um, and then the other system preference that goes along with this one is that you do have a URL where you can go ahead and have your privacy policy up there. So just be aware of that, okay? When I am in the OPAC and log in, it will tell me that we need, once I've logged in, it says, you know, we need your permission to keep you um, in or not. There is where you do have that link for the privacy policy. And I'm gonna go ahead and say, yes, I agree. But this button here, the no, I do not agree, is where we'll see the other sections of this uh, that were done in, um, in 1905. And so this is unsubscribe. Because the challenge that was happening is that we would have uh, library patrons who say, no, I don't agree, and I don't want you to keep my information, um, but then nothing else would happen. And so this new set of system preferences, just in case you ever stumble across them, basically says, I want you to lock or expire patrons that submitted an unsubscribe request or refused consent after this certain number of days. I want their accounts anonymized after this number of days, and then I want their account deleted after this number of days. Now you don't have to worry, this is not automatically turned on and the defaults are all set to not do anything. So you don't have to take any action. This is really more if you're interested in setting this up, you do have these abilities now that you can go ahead and set that so that it automatically clears that patron account out. Okay. Um, we did some to Andrew, did some we, Andrew did some testing and discovered that um, if a patron has something checked out, it will not delete their account. So in keeping with most of Koha's behavior, if a patron has something checked out, it will not delete their account. Um, however, if they do have everything returned, but they, do, they only owe you money, that account will be deleted using this functionality. So just be aware of that. Okay. Um, as, you, as always, if you're going to set something like this up, we do encourage you to, to set us a ticket so that we can work with you and, and make sure that everything is set up the way that it needs to, to be and you don't actually accidentally have patrons that are being deleted. 
Okay. A couple of more things in system preferences because we all love them so much. Um, Kelly, what's our count up to for system preferences? Do you remember? 1,750,000 and one. That certainly feels like that some days. <laughs> okay, so um, the code mirror, that's the new feature that was added to the reports where it shows you the purple for the statements and the red for this and the blue for this. It just basically kind of color codes everything for you. That has been added to um, some of the different functionalities in the system preferences. So for instance, on OPAC hidden items, um, if I go ahead and say, um, I need a quote in there. I'm trying to get it to not behave the way it's supposed to. There we go. Okay, you can see it's hard to see the blue, but the location does show in blue. And then the text that I put in there does show in red because that is quoted. And so that's what anything that's in quotes is supposed to show. It's those same color things that do come through here. So you will now see those in that section. Um, so they are in the OPAC hidden items and a couple of different places like that. So that's all well and good that that's all colorful and pretty, but it doesn't necessarily help me. Well, wait, there's more. When we go to our about Koha section, which I know most people never ever think it to look in, under system information now, it tells you that there's badly formatted YAML in OPAC hidden items and mark item fields to order. So this is a great way that you can immediately see if some of that YAML is not set up there right. Um, for those of you who are about to type in and say, what is YAML? YAML is um, jokingly, not jokingly referred to as yet another markup language. Bottom line is it's an um, indentation-based markup language that we use for things such as the OPAC hidden items, mark item fields to order, and a few different things in, this, in Koha. Um, so basically that's when we use those colon, space, parentheses, all of that sort of stuff. That's what YAML is. But that's really kind of cool now that that does go ahead and show here if I do have something formatted poorly in any of my YAML statements. So that's a really exciting time saver for a lot of us. The other thing that is really exciting in here too is that in both the CSS and the user JS, those are both using the code mirror too. So now I can start seeing here, I've got my things that are marked out that are in red, I've got things that are in blue, it goes ahead and shows me all of that sort of stuff. And now before anybody says anything, annoying script is what the partner actually called this. We copied this from another partner's site and they actually do call it annoying script. It's not something that we set up, it's what they actually named it and it's kind of funny. Um, but you do have that color coding that is showing now into the internet user JS, the OPAC user JS, and the CSSs also. So kind of exciting things, I think. Definitely helps those of us who are not fluent in some of these to be able to figure out what's going on in there and where we've made mistakes. Okay, the next one is not something that I can show you very easily, um, or at all, quite frankly, and this is the ability to add specific item types for the long overdue cron job. So really what this has done is this has added yet another layer to the long overdue cron. So not only can you spe uh, specify branches or patron categories, now you can also specify item types in your long overdues. So instead of having everything treated the same, you can go ahead and have your long overdue cron um, separated out. So you can either exclude uh, item types or have different standards for them. The one that I fall back to is that with um, long overdue, perhaps I have that set at 42 days overdue for books, but I don't necessarily want my DVDs to be sitting out there for 42 days long overdue before they get marked as lost. I want those to go lost at 14 days overdue. I can now set that up through that long overdue cron. So that is really helpful. Um, that is something to be aware of though, is that is done through a cron job. It is not done through the system preference one that you see here. Um, it's kind of funny, we keep going back and forth with this long overdue system preference, is that we want you to have control over being able to set this up, and that's fine if you want everything to be changed 
for every patient category, every item type, and every location at the same time, you still can go ahead and use the values that are sent here in your system preference. Um, but right now, this will only go ahead and accommodate one set of values. So if you do want to have those multiple values, um, you will not be using the system preference anymore. So just be aware of that one. Um, the next one is a test mode for notices. So Kelly, tell me how exciting you excited you are about this one. I am super excited. Super. Super. Um, I think this is going to probably benefit us more than anybody else. Um, so for new partners that are coming in or for libraries that do have a test site, this is really helpful. So there is a test mode for notices now. So there is a new, another new system preference. That's the one that took us over a million to a million and one. Um, and it's called send all emails to. And this is going to redirect all outgoing messages to the email address that you specify. So this would be holds notices, this would be lost notices, this will be overdues, this will be payment receipts, all of those notices, when you have this turned on, will redirect to whatever email address you specify. So this is gonna be great for libraries as we're setting them up, that you can actually see the email addresses that are going out without spamming your patrons when you're trying to test things out. Um, so that's an exciting one for us. Um, and then again, if you do have a test server, this is something that you can definitely use too and turn that on. Let us know, and, and there may be some setup that we need to do also to generate email notices for you. Um, but this is something that's gonna be really exciting and helpful that we can go ahead and verify those notices before they are sent out. Okay. The ability to send custom notices based on report output. Very exciting. It was sponsored by the Lancaster Theological Seminary. Basically what this is going to do is if you are familiar with the email or plugin that we've had around for a little while, it's the same premise, but it's so much easier to be able to do and you can have multiple ones set up. That was one of the complaints about the plugin emailer was that you could only have one notice at any given time. This one you can have multiple, you can set them up to be scheduled in advance, you can set them to be repeated. Um, they are done through cron jobs, so you will need to talk to us about setting these up and having them going. But really Really what it does is it takes a cron job or it adds a cron job that takes a report ID and a notice code and sends those custom emailers or emails out to users. Um, so for instance, if I go ahead and come into my notices, um, we have a code, a notice in here called Big Fine. When I look at that notice, it says, dear, and then it says, I'm pulling this information from the report that I've generated. No, Catherine, at this point, it is not generated for print yet. I would love to see that too, um, but it would be nice to have that done through, through print also. Um, so you can see that this is the report. This is what's going to be filled in from the report that I have created, and it's going to go ahead and populate that information in. So this is the notice. If I go to my reports and show you the corresponding report that we have set up for this one. Patrons who owe a lot of money. You can see it is pulling the email address, the first name, last name, and the total number of fines, and then that's going to pop over into those notices. So really exciting. Um, my first thought for this one, with this is going to be great for those libraries who send out all three overdue notices, but then also want to send out a bill after those long overdues or whatever crons have run for that last stage. So this is something that you could set up on a monthly basis. It'll go ahead and automatically pull those and send those notices out for you. So kind of exciting. Okay, um, do you want to point out that this notice does require use of the template toolkit. Um, so this is something that we are um, slowly migrating a lot of our notices to. It gives you a lot more flexibility as far as being able to generate notices and what data is filled in there. But you'll notice that that is the square bracket with the percentages, as opposed to my favorite hungry alligators. No more of those. We're slowly moving everything over to the square brackets, which I guess would be this if we were doing See, I like this better. Yeah, I, I know. I can't quite make that square bracket. Oh, um, it's fun. <laughs> okay. Um, something else that we can't really show, but just be aware of it, that with, for those libraries that have multiple locations, 
Um, there is a new, there's a new enhancement. Advanced notices send a separate digest message per branch. So what this will do is this will send out your pre-due notices per library. So for instance, if I have a patron that has two books checked out from branch A and two books checked out from branch, branch B, the patron will get e two emails, the branch email that lists their items and the branch B, uh, branch B email that lists those two items. Um, again, not mandatory, it is optional. Okay, but if, you, if that is something that does work for y'all, let us know and we'd be happy to go ahead and set those up. That's in the cron job, like, Line, command line, so. Yeah. The command line, the utilities. <laughs> I'm in command, I mean, Donna's in command. Yeah. I don't think either of one of us is today, but that's okay. Um, there is also a very misleading system preference that I don't want y'all to get too excited about if you happen to stumble across this one, like we did when we saw it. Okay. Fall back to SMS if no email system preference. Sounds really exciting. However, it does not do what you think it does. This will, if you turn this on, will send messages by SMS if no, P, if no patron email is defined, but only, only for the purchase suggestion notice. What the I heck? know, I know. I am looking at this with my glass half full and saying this was the first step in making sure that we can go ahead and apply this to everything. Interesting, interesting way to look at that. <laughs> um, so this is really more just kind of a heads up. If you see that system preferences and turn it on, it's not going to necessarily do what you think it does. It only does it for the purchase suggestion notification. So just kind of be aware of that one. Okay, moving right along. SIP. What? If you have an AMH and are using SIP, don't you love acronyms in libraries? We've got to be some of the worst at it. Probably only second to the government. Um, so <laughs> AMH is the Automatic Materials Handling Devices, um, commonly referred to as self-check-in, um, where you have that conveyor belt where you shove something through the slot and it goes ahead and processes it and shoots it off into the different carts and stuff. Those AMHs. Um, Pueblo City County Library District sponsored two developments to work better with SIP to enable their AMHs to work better. So if you have an AMH, um, you are more than welcome to use these. Um, it is the ability to send zero zero in the SIP CV field on check-in success and always send the CT field for SIP check-in even if empty. Um, I'm sure that makes sense to some people. So wait, the zero zero field, not the zero one field, Donna. Get, no, get the C V field. Dig in this little. What's a CV field, really? <laughs> so we just want to put it out there because we know that more libraries are getting the automatic material handling machines. Um, so just kind of be aware of that, that 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 has been enhanced. And we can thank Pueblo for that one. Can we get a systems person in here? <laughs> Maybe a developer. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to something that's a little bit more exciting, at least for me. I love the item search, and I am surprised by how many libraries don't know about item search. I have made it a personal crusade to let everyone know about item search because this is just so much fun to be able to search using the item search. One of the best enhancements that we see in here is Lost is now its own separate section and it will use any lost status that you have in your lost authorized values. So very exciting, a lot more flexibility here. So I can go ahead and do a search that says, just go ahead and do it off of my lost statuses. So I can see all of my things that are long overdue, or lost and paid for, missing, or that the gremlins took. So you can go ahead and use any of those that you have in your system. Um, so it's now been broken off into its own search filter. Let's go ahead and I'm going to do a search just for shelving location of audiobooks. Okay. Um, and so now it does go ahead and in my results, something that I have long asked for, it shows your item type also. So again, another enhancement that you can go ahead and see on your item searches, all of those different things. 
You also, and I don't think most people have noticed this, you can go ahead and filter once you've done that search again, that I can go ahead and say, you know what, out of all of these, just show me the item type gains, of which there was none, so that was a bad example. <laughs> Um, but then I can also go ahead and say, show me any of my lost statuses, if there was anything that the gremlins took or not, or that are empty, all of those sorts of things. So a lot of different flexibility in here for being able to search and pull these item searches. But I do love that we've added that item type there now. Makes it a lot easier to see exactly what you're looking for. Okay. And Kelly, what do you feel about the autocomplete to off? Yes. I was just going to say, why don't you show them what we learned about filtering by multiple columns? Shift click. Shift click. <laughs> Shift click. You didn't know this. So it's again, it's these little things that make us happy. So right now we can look at this and we can say that this is searched by, this is sorted by title, which is great. But not only do, do I need to be sorted by title, perhaps I also need to be sorted by call number or whatever the case that may be. What I can do now it's been sorted by title. I can hold down my shift button, click on call number column, and it went ahead and sorted them by call number. And perhaps I also want to sort it by shelving location next to. It'll go ahead and sort by then. And perhaps I also want to have it sorted by item type, shift click, and it's now been sorted by item type two as it goes. Now this was a really bad example because everything stayed where it was because <laughs> we don't have duplicates. But in theory, if we had duplicates, it would go ahead and have shown us those changes as we go through it. But remember, just that shift click is really helpful um, when you do have something like this, where you've got those multiple columns, you want to be able to, you know, filter down as you go with those sortings. Um, it'll work anywhere in Koha that you have these multiple columns with these toggles that you can go ahead and work with. So kind of exciting. Kind of. It's amazing. <laughs> So the really funny thing is that this actually came up as a, hey, can we develop this? Um, and someone said, well, why did we develop it? You can already do that. It was like, well, I don't think anybody really knows you can do that, so. Okay. Um, so back to my autocomplete equals off. What's your feeling on that one? <laughs> I don't know, Donna. Have strong feelings. So it's kind of been interesting. I've gotten a number of tickets lately um, where I'm seeing more libraries that are having challenges with the autocomplete in their browsers, um, where their browser is filling in things like the password that I use to log into Koha with. This can be a challenge because it's going to go ahead and throw errors when you're registering patrons, updating patrons, and things like this. And it is just something that we, we need to make everyone aware of is that if you are saving passwords in your browser, Koha will, not Koha, but your browser will fill them in, in inappropriate places. <laughs> don't do it, just don't do it. Don't, don't, save, your, don't save your Koha passwords um, in your browser because it will go ahead and try to fill those in and do, do weird things with that one. So this is kind of in line with that. And this is basically, um, you will have the ability to block the autocomplete in the patron search if you do have autocomplete on in your browser. So if I am in the patron search here, um, it would go ahead and stop me from filling in or, or you know, finishing anything that I had saved in there previously. So um, this will be a little bit of a, a little of enhancement, something you may not necessarily see, but it is there for you to be aware of. Okay, now this one I know Kelly is very, very excited about. I am very excited about this one too. And this is enhancements to the patron log. So here under my modification log, when I'm looking at a patron, this is what we currently see. It's just very basic information. You know, we can see that they changed the password, things like that. But now look what's happened is I can see in detail what was changed on that patron record. Um, so you'd be able to see this both in the logs and through the modification log, whichever way you do it, but it gives you enhanced information that you can see exactly what was changed. So you can see that that user ID was changed after and before. So it was Amelia.Bedelia and then it was changed to just Amelia. So not only can you see who did that, but you can see what exactly was changed. So very, very exciting. Um, it, so it includes the before and the after values when you are making those changes 
Um, so really a great addition to the logs. There is an ongoing effort to make the logs more useful and more readable, because um, right now you do have to do a lot of deciphering and, and comparison. But now this is gonna make things a whole lot easier for that. So I am very happy about that one. Okay. Me too. We are flying through this one and getting towards the end. So the last thing I want to mention, actually I have two. Um, one is for the plugins. So under administration, manage plugins, you'll notice there's now a big blue box there that says whether or not that plugin has been enabled. So what this is doing is this is giving me the ability to disable a plugin if I want to. And you can see that that one has now been made disabled. What's really, what prompted this is that if I wanted to turn off perhaps my CoverFlow plugin to do some tinkering with it, I really couldn't. It's either on or it's off. I don't have any other options. I would have to delete it. I wouldn't be able to leave it in there, play with it, and then enable it again. I would have to actually delete that and lose all of my values. So now I can go ahead and disable a plugin, which makes it not work, but I can still go in there and play with my settings and things like that without having to constantly reload or delete that plugin. So that's a really exciting functionality to be able to do that one. So this is really helpful, particularly when you are testing a new plugin to see if you want to use it or when it's not fully configured. I think immediately about some of the EDI, um, when we have libraries that are doing the EDI ordering and we set up the plugins for those, that you can go ahead and come in here and have that set, um, but not active just yet until you get everything finished so you're not getting bad error messages and things like that. Okay, last one. Under tools, nope. Let's try again. Going to authorized values under administration. Look at this. Isn't that pretty? <laughs> um, so authorized values has had basically just a, um, a facelift, I guess we could say. It's been made much, much easier to look at. Um, you do have the search functionality that you can go ahead and see those. Um, you can go ahead and add those right from this screen. And it does separate out that new category, which I know a lot of us clicked on new category instead of new authorized value when we were working on something. And so that has separated that out now, making it a lot easier to be able to do those. Okay. Um, I know the question is going to be coming, so I'm going to answer it ahead of time. Um, you cannot, unfortunately, edit these descriptions right now. And if you create your own category, you cannot add a description in there yet. Again, baby steps. We've got this one. Next step will be for us to be able to go ahead and edit those descriptions or add our own descriptions in there, but definitely much easier. Um, and it, you know, provides some really great descriptions for what these different things are. So instead of having guessing games of what this been fork means, you can see exactly what that is. <laughs> okay. So Kelly, did I miss anything? I think so. Excellent. Participants, any questions for me? Anything that you weren't sure about or that I need to touch base on again? I know this is not one of the more exciting sections, but there's some really cool stuff in here. So I'm glad that everyone was able to, to join us. And I'm, I, I kind of misspoke. Um, the manual 1811 does not have GDPR, but the 1905 manual has the new system preference and the original. So it's just missing in one of those. Okay, excellent. Oh, with the code mirroring. Absolutely. So I'm going to just go ahead and grab a, actually, I'll go ahead and grab that same report to bring in. Okay, so when I import it, okay, um, you can see in here that we're just missing different categories. Like you can see that that from is capitalized, but is part of blue and it shouldn't be. And the items and where are all the same color. If I just click on edit here, it'll go ahead and edit, open up my edit section. And then I could just come in here and use my spacing 
to go ahead and make those changes. So just like you would edit those right now, um, as you would come through and look for all of those sorts of things. So, um, so yeah, so basically just right there. Excellent. Um, and so I often joke when I am training that that's the only time most libraries would ever look at the About Koha tab. Um, but now we're finding more reasons to send people that direction. So here from our main screen, we do have that About Koha section. And it has a few different tabs in here. Um, it does tell you most importantly what version you are on. And so that's one of the first places we check when we are doing troubleshooting for y'all is to see what version you are set to. Um, the rest of the stuff just kind of tells us if, you know, Zebra's running, if it's been memcached. Um, the local date and time is really important too. It does tell you what time zone you are in or your server is on. So this is one of the places that we check too. If we say that there's weird things happening with dates and times, we can see where that one is. Um, then we do have a tab on Perl modules. This means nothing to me, but it's there. Um, the system information is where uh, we went to today, which is warnings regarding system configuration. This is where we found those badly formatted YAML sections. Um, so really that system information under about Koha is going to be the most helpful part for that one. Okay. Um, and just out of curiosity's sake, we do have the Koha team. So with each release, it does go ahead and include everyone who was involved in it. Um, and this is where I always tell people, this gives you a really great sense of how people have come together as a community to make Koha as amazing as it is. This is everyone that's been involved in getting Koha to where it is. It's pretty impressive. Um, it really does make you feel great. Um, when you look at these sorts of things of everyone that's been involved in here. And if you want your name here, just like I'm thinking Kelly's name should be here somewhere. No, no it's not. I not want yet. it. No. No. Okay. I, um, I signed off on bugs for future versions, but not this version. Okay. If you sign off on bugs, your name will be in here forever and ever and ever. Um, so I don't think mine is in here yet either. No, mine's in a future version. Mine's in 1911 also. But if you do sign off on bugs, your name will be added here and kept here um, because it is a huge part of what makes Koha so amazing is all the people that have pitched in, even if it's just one bug that's been signed off on and approved to make Koha better. You will find most of Bywater's staff names in here. Um, we do a lot of testing and things like that, all of those sorts of things. Um, and then you, so just kind of be aware of that. That's what the Koha team is. Licenses shows you what materials or what products we use. Um, translations, this is always my pitch. If you speak another language and want to be helpful, these are all the languages that Koha has been translated into. And they are always looking for people that would be willing to help translate both the software itself and the manual. So. Um, again, just really a great sense of, of how broad this is. And then the timeline um, shows you how Koha developed over the years. So that's that whole about Koha section. But again, the most important part is going to be that systems information for those YAML um, things that I broke today when we were demonstrating. So, excellent. Okay. I'll say we'll wait just a couple more minutes to see if anybody else has any other questions. So while we're waiting, I'll tell another one of my really bad jokes. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, it's really good. It's so okay. <laughs> you never want me to have any fun. <laughs> what kind of dinosaur loves to sleep? What? A stegosaurus. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, little kids think I'm hysterical. <laughs> yep, I'm sure they do. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much. As always, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. We're, we're always happy to chat with you, Zoom with you, whatever it takes. <laughs>